welcome to the ICC Nairobi podcast, where we are all about raising godly generations. We're so glad you're here, and we believe that wherever you're listening to us from, this word will bless and minister to you. I want you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and your power. Oh, God, thank you for each person that is here and those who are online. You know, Father, part of my frustration every time I stand to speak or preach is that I don't know the stress or the struggles or the strain or the issues, Lord, that my brothers and sisters are laboring under. But God, we know that you know. So Spirit of the living God, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts. Give us the unusual ability to focus and concentrate May we not lose anything that you would have to say to us. Speak, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Preaching to me is not speech making. Preaching to me is a word from God for the people at a moment in history. And so I pray and take very seriously every opportunity to to speak. Um, I wrestled this morning. There are two messages on my heart that I had prepared and I didn't know which way to go. And so Uh, In the first service, I talked about experiencing God's power, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I feel led this second service to talk about how not to be branded by discouragement. How not to be branded by discouragement. You know what I mean by that. We've all met people who have had the wind knocked out of them. The shoulders are permanently slumped. Their heads are sometimes held down. Um, they tend to look at what I call the south side of life all the time, the negative. And often that's just protective behavior because they've been disappointed so many times that they're afraid to trust again. So they slash their expectations and they settle for less. Uh, They have become what has happened to them. They have become the victims of, of things that are out of their control. Well, how do we not be branded? by discouragement. How how do we not let that stuff stick? And let me just quickly say, if you're older than four years old, you're going to be discouraged. It's not a question of whether or not we're going to be discouraged. If you live life, you're going to be discouraged. So the issue is not how to necessarily avoid it, but how do I deal with it when it visits me? How do I deal with it when that email shows up that I didn't agree with and I don't like or that person did or said things that just cut me to the quick or, you know, all the garden variety of issues of life? What do I do? Well, I want you to put a pin in that and close the parentheses, but I want to I want to differentiate between three words that sometimes we use interchangeably, but they're very different. Disappointment, discouragement and depression. Disappointment doesn't necessarily mean that you are discouraged if Every day we're disappointed. Somebody didn't show up on time. They didn't return my phone call. They didn't return the email or, or the text message or this didn't, or they didn't, whatever. It's just life. Uh, that doesn't, it just means that an expectation has not been met. Let me skip over discouragement and go to the other extreme. Depression, and I've got to be careful on this because that's a little bit above my pay grade. I don't have any training in clinical psychology or that kind of thing, but the signature of, the, of depression, whether it's clinical depression or circumstantial depression, the signature is that you've been thrust beneath the hope line. It's, it's, you can't find hope, and you've been placed in this downward spiral, even anger turned inward, and that kind of thing, and you get stuck there. And what I would say, and I'll get away from this, the, the one thing I would say for those of us who are struggling and wrestling with depression The irony is, is that you have to force yourself to do what you absolutely don't want to do. And that is to reach out and get help because we need others to help us to recalibrate our thinking and pull us back up above the hope line. But in the middle is this word discouragement. Discouragement is more than just your garden variety set of disappointments. But it's not quite depression. Uh, discouragement means what the word suggests. It means that the courage has been taken away from you. The word picture that I have is that the wind has been knocked out of you. Uh, you, You're still moving ahead. You're still functioning. but Maybe you're going 50 or 60 percent. It's almost as if you're dragging this anchor, but you're still moving. Well, how do I how do I how do I manage that? 
How do I deal with that? How do I not let that stick when it visits my domain and messes up my plans? And I read something and I say, this is awful. What do I do? I've discovered in my life that decisions and choices will determine my demeanor and responses. We're not passive when we're discouraged. It is the choices that we make, the decisions that we make when bad things happen that will determine whether or not that's going to be permanent. You see, when you're born, you look like your parents, but when you die, you look like your decisions. Life is ruthless. It is cruel. And we're not passive even when bad stuff happens to us. So I, I want to share with you, the, I'm, I'm very familiar with discouragement, <laughs> being a pastor all these years and us stuff raising four kids and all of that. I'm familiar with discouragement. What do you do? Well, I, this is a page out of my journal. I've discovered that I've got to make at least these five choices, these five decisions, or if this stuff is going to get permanent. I'm going to be branded by it. It's going to become a part of my biographical sketch, my resume. The first choice or decision that I have to make when discouragement comes visiting me and knocking on my door is that, number one, I have to choose, choose, choose truth. Choose truth. What do you mean? I think, well, truth in two ways, and I want to camp on the second way. Truth, number one, about the situ- about what has happened. Denial complicates everything. Hiding from what happened just complicates all of life. And so I've discovered that when I get a gut punch and I get some bad information, typically I have to be careful not to say much during that time because knowing me, if I start saying something, my, it won't be a response, it will be a reaction and it always will be exaggerated. So I had to pull back. I've got to pull back, usually get a good night's sleep. And then the next morning, uh, usually it's not as bad as I thought it was. Quite frankly, sometimes it's worse, but it, usually it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Choose truth. But the other one, what I'm talking about, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You've got to choose the truth of God's Word. You have to choose the truth of God's Word. David said, or I don't know that David wrote Psalm 119, but the, 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 the writer of Psalm 119 in verse 143, listen to this line. He says, trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Marinate in that for a second. The anthology, the preface to the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, begins by driving decisions. The very first verse says, blessed is the man who does not, who does not, who does not, who does not. You make choices. But what does he do? But his delight, choice. But his delight, choice, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. The Bible was given to us not just for us to feel good. It's not just a a, a collection of of, of sentimental statements or motivational statements. The Bible is the very voice. Did you hear me? It's the very voice of God. And truth is given to recalibrate our thinking. And so when the wind is knocked out of us, we've got to stop listening to the relative truths of those around us in our circumstances and allow this book to speak to us. God, what do you have to say to me? You choose, you choose, you choose truth. So when discouragement comes knocking on your door, you come back from the doctor and the blood work is not what it should be. One of your children decides to have a moral meltdown. What are you going to do? You can't run from it. That old statement, it is what it is. But I've got some decisions to make. I choose, choose truth. The second thing that you have to decide in order for this stuff not to stick to you, is that you have to choose. You're going to think I lost my mind when I make this statement, okay? But hang in there. I'm not totally insane. You have to choose, choose, choose joy. You're saying, hold hold up, Crawford. (laughs) 
Joy, isn't joy, isn't joy just an involuntary response to favorable circumstances? Well, therein lies our problem. Therein lies our problem. Joy in the Bible is anchored in that which can never be affected. Now, let me back up and, and say this to you. In, in Philippians chapter 4, I want to quote that verse and then drop it in its broader context. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, do you know where he was when he wrote that? Do you know where he was? He was in prison. He was in jail. And he understood, if you read Philippians chapter 4, he understood that this wasn't probably going to turn out well for him. That he, in all likelihood, would die. History tells us that he was decapitated for his faith. And by the way, he was in jail on trumped up charges. He was in jail because people lied on him. So you're saying to yourself, well, Paul, what, 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 what are you talking about? Rejoice in the Lord always. Your circumstances says that you ought to be in a fetal position. You, you, you ought to be permanently depressed. All this stuff that's happened to you. Paul was not living in denial. Actually, the church at Philippi got started. You know how it got started? Uh, Paul recruited this guy by the name of Silas in Acts chapter 16. They went over to Macedonia, the region in which Philippi was uh, located. And uh, so they were going to share the gospel. And so they're sharing the gospel, and Silas is excited to be with his friend Paul. And they're sharing the gospel, thinking this is a wonderful thing. And because they're doing the will of God, everything should turn out right and should be favorable in their circumstances. And they should deny the reality of bad stuff, okay? They're sharing the gospel. Well, this little demon-possessed girl, as Paul and Silas are there ministering, is following them. And Luke records in Luke, Acts chapter 16 that this, this girl, she was a fortune teller, but she was demon-possessed. But she was making a lot of money for the people that kind of owned her because that was her gig. That was the thing that she did. And I love what Luke says because this sounds so much like Crawford. Luke says, Paul, this girl following him, Paul all of a sudden gets annoyed. He gets annoyed. So he turns around and he rebukes the demon from the girl. Well, what happens then is that things go crazy. The people jump on Paul and Silas and they beat them. We're not talking about being roughed up. They beat them, perhaps broken, broken nose, contusions, this kind of, and they throw them in jail. Now, listen to me. If I'm Silas, I'm sitting there in jail with blood dripping down my mouth and some teeth missing or whatever, and I'm looking at him and said, hey, hey, man, I didn't sign up for this. What did we do wrong? Aren't, aren't followers of Jesus ought to be walking in one glorious victory, the victory? Aren't people in the will of God always supposed to have stuff that goes easy? Read Acts 16. You know what they're doing? You know what they're doing? They're in the corner of the jail. Eyes swollen shut, broken noses, whatever. But they're singing. Why are they singing? They're defying the sovereignty of their circumstances. They're refusing to let their circumstances be sovereign. They understood that joy was not tied to the erratic changes of life. But joy was anchored in that which could never be affected. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, the last paragraph, Who or what shall separate us from the love of God? He wrote later on in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't like what's happening to me, but I refuse, I refuse to let it determine my response to God. I choose joy. I choose joy. My joy can't be taken. Jesus can't be taken from you. The promises of God can't be taken away from you. Love cannot be taken away from you. So when discouragement comes visiting you, messing up your plans, got some decisions to make. I choose truth. I want to go vertical. What does God say? I choose joy. I choose joy. That he will never leave me or forsake me. And with tears streaming down my cheeks, I rejoice. Then third decision you have to make. 
When discouragement comes messing with you, you open up your inbox and you go, oh my word. What are you going to do? Well, thirdly, you choose. Choose faith. Faith. Interestingly enough, I wrote a book a number of years on faith. Um, faith does not exist apart from opposition. What gives meaning to faith is opposition. That's what gives meaning to faith. faith. Uh, any, any, any expressions of faith that's not uh, anchored in defiance, and I'll get back to that in a, in a moment, is nothing more than just academic talk. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's not so much a definition of faith as it is a description of it. Then down in verse, I quoted Hebrews 11, 1, down in verse 6, uh, the, the writer says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must believe that he exists and is rewarded for those who diligently seek him. Now when you read the rest of Hebrews 11, it's interesting. The rest of Hebrews 11 are biographical snapshots of great men and women of God who defied the opposition that came up against them. They looked through it. That's why I want to say to you is this. Listen, listen. Faith in the Bible is not denial. It is not denial. It is not the denial of bad things. You will never read from Genesis to Revelation any great man or woman of God denying the reality of bad stuff. You'll never read it. But what faith in the Bible is, is that it is defiance. What do you mean by defiance? It defies the bad stuff that happens to control them. It looks at the bad stuff, doesn't deny it, sees it for what it is, but it looks through it to see a God that is greater, a God that is bigger, a God that is able, and it's driven by its vision of God. And as I said in the earlier service, I say this again. A God who raised the dead Jesus can take care of any issue, any circumstance, and any opposition you may face. And sometimes we turn to God when our foundations are shaking only to discover it's God who's shaking them. Maybe life has been too predictable for you, Crawford. Maybe things have been working out too. Maybe you've been a tad bit too resourceful. And you confuse your resources with the source. No, you don't trust your resources. You trust the source. So I've got to put you in a situation. You have to trust me. Believe me. See, but faith in the Bible is also desperation. Now, pay, pay, pay attention here. Notice I did not say despair. Biblical, desper biblical, biblical desperation is not despair. Despair is hopelessness. Desperation is the focused determination to get to the source of hope. The classic illustration of that is uh, Luke chapter 8. Remember the story of the woman with an issue of blood for 12 years? She's hemorrhaging, right? She spent everything, everything. And this probably takes place in the first year and a half or two years of our Lord's earthly ministry when all the groupies and pop people wanting stuff from Jesus were following him. And she hears that Jesus and his followers are coming down the road. This lady's desperate. And as Luke writes, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of people pressing in, wanting something from Jesus. Luke records that people are bumping up against him. Everybody wants something from Jesus. But this lady says, if I can just, if I can just touch the fringe or hem of his garment. Do you know why she said that? It's not in the text, but it's strongly implied. She said that because she was a Jew. You say, well, what, what does that got to do with anything? Well, because of the Levitical code, she could not come in contact because of the fact that she was bleeding with a rabbi. She was considered unclean. That's why she said, if I can just come in contact with his clothing. Now picture this. This lady has no other option. She spent everything. She's on her knees dodging ankles to get in touch with Jesus. And then she, she, she reaches out and touches just the hem of his tunic. And Jesus stops. This is God Almighty. This is amazing. Jesus stops and he says, 
Listen to this. Mind you, context. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are huddled around them, bumping up against Jesus. And Jesus says, who, who touched me? Who touched me? Typically, Peter says, um, <laughs> been a lot of people bumping up against you. And in so many words, Jesus says, no, you missed the point. They handled me, but somebody touched me. Desperation is our call to worship. And when the wind is knocked out of you, you've got to force yourself to say, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? I've got to go to the source. And that's the reason why, in some perverse sense, that discouragement is a gift. And that sounds crazy. Uncertainty is a gift. Because it, it puts the spotlight on that which is certain. Your plans are not certain. Your goals and dreams, they're not certain. Jesus is certain. So you choose faith. I got to hustle on here. So what do you do when discouragement comes knocking on your door, visiting your life? You didn't sign up for this. You weren't looking for this. Things are going relatively great until this happens. We got some decisions to make or this stuff will stick. It's not whether or not it, it will stick. You got to choose truth. You got to choose joy. You got to choose faith. Now listen to this one. You also have to choose, number four, community. You got to choose community. Hear me on this. I don't know that it's true so much here, but it's all, well, it is probably true here as, West, as, as it is in the United States. In the Western world, uh, Christianity uh, has become hyper independent. It's almost as if we're a coalition of independent contractors, just me and Jesus. Well, the truth of the matter is, the Bible teaches quite clearly, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's no such thing as a private Christian. If you have God as your father, then you have to have the church as your mother. For by one spirit have we all been baptized into the body of Christ. And all of the one another's in the New Testament, we, we, we're related to each other. Your enemy at all times, but especially, especially when you're going through a hard time and you, you want to pull back from people, your, your answer is right next to you. And so you have to choose community. We, we, we need to feel the love of God from one another. And often God uses discouragement to flush the pride out of us. God uses hard times to help us to see we're not our own saviors. You're not smart enough, neither am I. Nobody ever bootstrapped their way out of problems. You don't know enough, neither do I. We're not the fourth members of the Trinity. We need each other. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, community breaks up in these two broad buckets. One is that we need support. That's what Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 is all about. Bear one another's burdens. You were not meant to carry this stuff by yourself. Bear one another's burdens. And then the other bucket has to do with, with, with empathy and identification. Romans chapter 12. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. One of the things that used to frustrate me as a pastor, I pastored a pretty sizable church there, and people who were very successful, a lot of them there. But the problem with that is that, you know, you know, there's a lot of image management going on. They're not as good as the house that they live in. They're just as jacked up and screwed up as everybody else. But what would bother me to no end, they would be hurting but because they want this pride peace would force them toward isolation. 
And by the time they shared it, you, I would say, how come you didn't say something? We need each other. I happen to be, and this is a little bit too much information, but I happen to be on the personality scale. I happen to be an introvert. Most people think I'm an extrovert because I'm with a lot of people, but I'm, but I'm, I'm an introvert. I, I'm an introvert that loves people. I'm not socially awkward or anything like that, but I don't get my energy from people. Well, the downside of that, however, for those of us who are introverts, and there's probably a considerable number of us in here, for those of us introverts, the downside of that whole deal is that when bad things happen, we tend to keep our own counsel a little bit too long. A little bit too long. And isolation always, isolation always, isolation always breeds distortion. Always. You exaggerate what happens. We need one another. For the sake of time, let me just rush to the last one. So what do you do when discouragement visits you, knocks on your door? You better make some decisions pretty fast or it's going to stick. The cement will harden. I, I have to choose truth. You, you're going to have to choose joy. You're going to have to choose faith. What are the options? You, you, you need to choose community or else you're going to have some demented, distorted thinking. But the fifth one is this. There are circumstances in life where you, you just have to keep moving. You just have to keep moving. You're going to get some bad news and you feel like just closing the doors and turning off your cell phone and not responding to people. But there are those times in life and God will put you there that despite what you're going through, you're going to have to keep pressing on. So you choose, you choose service. Let me tell you a quick story, and I'll close with a passage of Scripture. Um, this is deeply personal, but I'm going to keep it real here. Um, pastors are shepherds, but they're also sheep. Uh, some years back, some years back, our oldest daughter went through a horrible experience, and it wasn't her fault. It was just a horrible, I won't go through the details. But it happened during a time um, where it was not appropriate for us, Karen, and our family to share what had happened. It just wasn't a, it wasn't a pride thing. It was complicated. There were other parties involved in this kind of thing, and some had high profile, and so it just wasn't. And as a father, I'm a dad. And especially when it comes to my daughters, I'm a fixer. I couldn't fix this. I couldn't fix it. And my daughter's hurting. But it was also during this time that I, it was a three-week period, I had to continue to preach. It's just some dynamics going on. And I remember pulling up to the church for our early service, sitting in my car, and the tears streaming down my cheeks because I didn't want to preach. And I would say, Holy Spirit, please, one more time. Just one more time. And I would preach. And I remember driving home after our services thinking, that was a hot mess. But you know what happened? Later on, I went back and listened to those messages. It was some of the best messages I've ever preached in my life. I kid you not. What I want to say to you is this. Who told you to stop? Who told you to have a pity party? Who told you to be immobile? Who told you to give up? Let me read this text and I'll pray. <sighs> Psalm 126. Listen to these poetic words and pay attention to the word picture. Psalm 126 verse 4 says, Restore our, our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in an Agab. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Pay close attention. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. 
You get the word picture here. Do you know what the Negev is? The Negev is the arid desert portion of Israel. And the word picture is, is this farmer, he didn't have any more options. But the ground is parched and dry. But his survival is based upon his ability to raise a crop. So with tears streaming down his cheeks and dripping on the soil, he continues to sow the seed and sow the seed and sow the seed and sow the seed and nothing's coming up, but I, I'm doing it anyway because I got to. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> this bumper crop sprouts up. You see, it's, you see, what the inference of the passage is is that your tears a holy fertilizer that will cause things to grow. And sometimes God purposely will withdraw the sense of his presence to strengthen your hunger and pursuit of him. What you need to, some of you need to hear this today. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. You got to throw your pride away and let God carry you. You don't need faith for stuff tomorrow, just grace for the moment. Let Him carry you. Let him, the story's not over. Stop writing your obituary. As long as there's breath in your body, there's hope. Your experience is not terminal. God is a miraculous God. What he wants from you is faithful obedience and trust in that moment. And he will carry you. Now some of you here, some of you here, your first step are not these five choices. There's a choice that's, pre, that's a prerequisite. What your choice is, you need to come to Jesus first. And Jesus says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. Your first decision is to say, Lord Jesus, I need to get rid of the burden of sin. I need to get rid of this uncertainty about what's going to happen to me if I should die. You need to embrace Christ, realizing that he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I died on the cross in your place and for your sin. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my sin, and I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Whether you're watching on the line or you're sitting here, you can go forth as a new person and understand and experience the love of God. Holy Father, thank you for yourself. You are the great burden bearer, Father. You're the great burden bearer. We don't choose the stuff that we go through. But we do have the privilege of choosing a rock-solid Savior who can take us through anything. So God, give us the will to choose, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about ICC Nairobi, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at ICC underscore Nairobi or our website iccnairobi.org. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your family and friends. Until next time.